the lecture is called Translating an Ayurvedic Integral Psychology. And integral is about integration. <clears throat> when we look at India um, at the time of uh, independence, there was a big debate of what Ayurveda was going to look like. Does it look like classical Ayurveda or do we integrate it with Western traditional medicine? And what won at that time in India is integrating. So, it, so Ayurveda in India is already an integral system. But psychology was not integrated because in 1948, Western uh, psychology did not have the framework to integrate Ayurveda. I, I use the term translating here because the, because the words that we use have a big impact in how we understand what we are studying. So often, and, and so the first thing we have to do is we have to understand what is psychology. And if we, when we translate psychology into Sanskrit or sans, what term in Sanskrit is, represents psychology. And so we have Sattva Vijaya, we have uh, Bhutta Vidya, we have uh, Manas Roga, we have all these terms. And what I say is that none of them actually translate into psychology. And the analogy I like to use is if we put all the women in this side of the room and all the men in that side of the room, we have a certain division. Now, if we put all the therapists on one side and all the students on another side, we have a different division. So if I say, and we take those two, and I say, well, translate the left side of the room, it's a completely different division. So what India utilizes for treatment of mind and what in the West is being used for treatment of mind, there's a different division happening. And so to really integrate we have to pick it apart and, and understand how each is being divided and what the terms in each one actually means. So William Wundt um, is considered the first psychologist. 1879, he's the first person to use the term psychologist. And he, he actually had a really big vision. And everybody after him kind of, they couldn't contain that big vision that he had. But he defined psychology as the general principles of the entire experience in its immediate subjective reality. So that was his definition of psychology, the first psychologist. Now, to me, that subjective, the entire experience of subjective reality, that is the experiencer. And one of the terms used in Sanskrit is bhokta. Bhokta means the, the person who's eating or who's experiencing reality. So, from his definition, we're looking at Bhotravidya. If we go the other direction, we take psychology into Sanskrit, psyche, Plato defines psyche into it as three parts. He defines it as intellect, emotions, and instinct. So the closest thing that that would correlate to from an Ayurvedic system is the Antakarana. So psychology, we could actually take, if we took it the other direction in the Sanskrit, would be Antakaranavidya. So these, these terms, they make a big difference because they're letting us know what we're looking at. Um, so we're looking at the, the science of experience, Bhokta Vidya. Um, so I start with this verse from Brihadaranyaka Upanishad. And I'm going to end with, with this same verse. So this verse begins with uh, Janaka Rishi. Uh, talking to Yogana Volka, and they're discussing uh, Akash and Vak being the foundation of, of reality. And um, Jonah, Yogana Volka says that we pay attention to Vak by Pragya. So Pragya is what allows us to, to pay attention to, to Vak, speech. And we need to understand Pragya. Pragna Parad is, is the biggest cause of disease, both physically and mentally. So Janaka asks, well, what is Pragya? And Yogna Volka replies that it is Vak itself. He says it's speech itself. Through speaking, we know a friend. As well as the four Vedas, history, mythology, sciences, Upanishads, mantras, afores, and elucidations. Um, everything about this world and the world beyond is known, Pragya, through speech. So speech is, is communicating with us what we understand about reality. Everything we know, 
anything we understand is coming through language. So this, and, and this is throughout the Sanskrit literature, this concept of, of our reality is created by the language that we know. Again, going back to this concept of retranslating and how important the terminology we use is. Um, so uh, this was originally translated by, in the late 1700s, early 1800s by a bunch of German language scholars. And this created what's called the linguistic turn. The linguistic turn was when Europeans realized that their minds have languaging and that they're perceiving based upon their language and they can actually study language and they don't have to just be language. And this created the, the revolution that created philosophers of mind and um, created uh, the first psychologists. So the first psychologists are rooted back to Sanskrit translators. But, but this first, right, and, and so those first translators, they came up with a, a philosophy called structuralism and social constructionism. That our language is, is structuring the way we see reality. So language, digging deeper into language. There's a very big difference between English and Sanskrit. And I'm just going to take the word ego and ahankara as, as an example. So ego is, is what in English they use to represent I. And it's a noun. It's representing a thing. So there's an ego as a thing. And English is a thing-based language. Where if we look at the Sanskrit, it's a hunkara. And a hunkara is the I maker. And even a hum is, is a combination of, of a verbal root. So Sanskrit language is working from the space of verbal roots. It's creating what, what we can call as, as a functional language. A language that's talking about process and how things are happening. So the I is a constant process of I, of, of identifying an individual reality. It's not a thing that we can find. It's a process that's happening. So it's a very different perspective. Um, now, the noun language is great for material reality. And Western science has expanded materiality to such a deep level. And so for neurology and the study of neurology, noun language is great. But the mind isn't physical. And, and you can't touch it. So noun language just misses mind constantly. So Sanskrit has an inbuilt uh, benefit for psychology just by being function-oriented. Um, so language, language can make or break an idea. And the example I use is the story of the discovery of the reflexive nervous system. So in the 1700s, there was a guy named, uh, a scientist, Robert White. And when he first understood how the spine activates a muscle, he wrote about it as the soul controlling the body. Because that's, that, that's how he perceived it. Um, sometime later, a scientist named Charles Sherrington took his research, reworked it, and he said that the mind, that the brain, works like a telegraph system through the spine, communicating with the muscles. Now, Sherrington is considered the, in, the discoverer of the reflexive nervous system. Even though before it was, it was already discovered, he was saying soul is how the soul is moving the body versus how the brain is talking. So just that different terminology changed who was recognized and who wasn't. So as we translate Ayurveda, and particularly Ayurvedic psychology, into English, we have to be very aware that how we translate these words will make or break how they are received into Western culture. So language and translating. So this is a little history of Sanskrit dictionaries. First one being 1720s, the first Sanskrit dictionary was Sanskrit into Portuguese. In India, they don't do dictionaries because they work with verbal roots, and that root can become anything. It's not a fixed language. It's, it's constantly changing, and it's, it's, a, it's a, a live language. Dictionaries are great for dead languages. Languages where you have a word, and that can be the only word. Because, it, and just as an example, Ayurveda, we can be Ayurveda-ing at this point at this workshop here. I can be an Ayurveda-er, a person who's doing Ayurveda. In Sanskrit, 
you can, language is generative. It, you can constantly taking any word and, and changing it. So there was no use of dictionaries because there's millions and millions of words. Um, so 1720s was the first Sanskrit dictionary. Uh, the two most used were, are Monia Williams in 1870 and Opte, which is 1890. So all the words we're using for psychology are coming from the 1800s. Now 1800, Europeans in the 1800, what was their understanding of mind? When we look at the literature, it's extremely limited. They, they looked at, at, at the rest of the world as barbarians. If we look at their psych psychological ideas, they're barbarians. They, they had a very limited view. So we have maybe 20 words in Sanskrit that are all translated as thinking. They didn't have different words. They didn't understand what those words meant. So, so here I bring up three really important words. And, and by understanding these three words, we're understanding three different states of consciousness uh, and rooted in the three different bodies. So we have physical body, mental body, and causal body. And within that, we have jnana, vijnana, and pragya. So jnana is, and, and most of the time these are translated relatively the same. Jnana is rational knowledge. You can pick up a book and you can learn it. You can read it without a teacher. You can, anybody, jnana can be transferred on the internet. So, so it's, it's rational knowledge. Vigyana. And so this is one that I translate different than any dictionary you've seen. And whenever there's this VI on a word that's related to mind, and, and it, at first I was like, I was unsure, and I started looking at all the literature, and I saw that every time that there's V, it's, it's referring to a, a, a reflective, uh, a mentally reflective action. So the English similar to that is meta. If we look at meta-knowledge, it's knowledge about knowledge. So vigyana is knowledge that there's an experience that happens, there's an interaction that happens. So this is knowledge that's much more on the subtle level, which is very different than jnana. You can't read vijnana. Vijnana has to be transmitted. It has to be connected. There's an interaction that happens. Um, if we look at other words with vi in front, and so vi is often translated as other than, apart, away from, special. So sometimes it's translated as other type of knowledge or special knowledge or something of that nature. But that was, remember, that's coming from the 1800s translations. So where they weren't really working too much with meta-knowledge at that period of time. So if we take this and understand this as this meta-knowledge, this deeper reflective knowledge, and we look at all of its uses in, in the text, all of a sudden those texts have such a deeper meaning and a deeper implication. Uh, vichara is, is reflection. Vipassana means to discern. Uh, vipassana meditation is, is based on this. You're watching your mind. So pasya means to watch. Vipassana is watching your own mind. So that little bit of a difference, it, it becomes a meta-watching. Um, vimarsha is reflective awareness. It's, it's being aware that I'm talking right now. I'm moving. My body's moving. I'm in a room. So that's vimarsha. So all these words with vi become this self-reflective uh, action. Then we have pragya. And pragya is, is a very interesting word that really, before psychology hit where it is the last 30 years, it would have never been able to be translated. Um, pra means before or in front of. And often when people say pragya, they think this, this high spiritual knowledge is something that's up there and beyond. And I hopefully, by the end of this, am going to take it instead deeper inside. Um, there's a word used in, in humanistic psychology called felt sense. And it means this deeper feeling that the person has. And it's not an emotion, but it's, it's this felt sense, this you know it's right, you know it's not right, you know that it's time to leave now, this, this deeper uh, inner, inner um, knowledge. Uh, one term that's used in, in, uh, by Abhinava Gupta, he's, he talks about it, it's uh, felt his ringing of prana through the limbs of the body. And so 
how do we get knowledge, but it's ringing as prana through the limbs of the body? And in, in a lot of the Upanishads, they, they connect pragya with prana. So my understanding that I've gotten from my tradition and, and, and learning Western uh, psychology is that this is connected to the felt sense, this deeper body wisdom, this deeper knowing inside of us. And when we take that to pragna aparada, then we, we get a much deeper understanding. It's not a mistake of the intellect. As an intellect, it's in our brain. It's not like, I knew I shouldn't do that, and I did it anyway. It's my, I knew, and, and, and I, I, I avoid gut level, because gut kind of has an instinctual level, and I want to take, I, I want to, share that pragya is the body's deep wisdom that knows even more than our intellect does. It's this deep awareness that the atma is communicating through our entire body, through the prana moving through us, and that when we listen to the body, we listen to the movement of prana, we listen to these feelings that are arising, they're going to guide us in the right direction. And when we get stuck in our head, or believe that, oh, this is right and this is wrong, or, or I don't have time to do that, and we, do something, and we don't listen to this inner guidance, this inner movement, this felt sense pushing us in a certain direction, then we have the mistake. So when we translate it as mistake of the intellect, do, do we not lose something? So pragya is this deep, it's, so, it's much deeper than the intellect. So now applying this, uh, uh, so in clinical psychotherapy, and psychotherapy is the application of psychology for healing purposes. There's three main schools right now, uh, and uh, those schools are competing with each other, and they say bad things about each other, and they all try and show who's better than. Uh, we have behavioral psychology, which is a very biomechanical uh, approach. We have psychodynamic, which is looking at these things in your mind. What's repressed? What's held back? What's, is the, did the ego not get formed properly? Is the ego too strong? Then we have humanistic, and humanistic is, is really, it says, let's focus on the person, let's focus on what's going on to them, and, and really listen deeply. And so it's, it's more about by listening deeply, we actually pull out of the person what they need to heal themselves. Um, and then there's common factors theory, which to me has the biggest implications on Ayurveda possible out of all Western research, uh, but that's another lecture. Um, so all these, these three are competing with each other. And starting in the 60s, they started to have something called psychotherapy integration, which means how do we mix these different schools together? And what happened is, is there's these different schools of mixing, but the mixing is basically somebody is a psychodynamic and they mix something else in with what they're doing. Or they're uh, cognitive behavioral and they're mixing in something else. There's no reason for why to mix what with what. So, there's three different uh, ideas behind how do we mix these different psychotherapies. One is technical eclecticism. It means, well, for this disorder we'll use this technique, for this disorder we'll use cognitive behavioral, for this disorder we'll use humanistic. So it's just in different situations using different ones. Then there's theoretical integration, where they try and have some theory that overlaps, yet they use the two different um, techniques separate. And then there's assimilative integration, which is combining everything together. It's combining the theory and utilizing the techniques together. And uh, I, I like to think that Ayurveda is in a, is, is, has the ability to work on an assimilative paradigm in that it has the ability to have a single structure of what consciousness is. And Ayurveda says, why should we use which technique when? And this is something that Western psychology doesn't have. It doesn't have a, a clear understanding of the full science of the experiencer. And by us, as Ayurvedic practitioners, understanding the full practice of uh, how the mind works and how we treat the mind, we can take these different schools and know when to use which. Um, so, psychotherapy integration. Um, so here I talk about just uh, jnana, vigyana, and pragya as, as utilizing them as similarly to how the body, there's three bodies, 
But on a psychological level, we have three states of consciousness, not three physical bodies. Um, so cognitive behavioral therapy is, is the realm of gyan. It's all about samskaras, and it's about training people. It's, on a certain level, it's very Pavlovian. You ring a bell every time you feed the dog, and, and he salivates, and eventually you ring the bell, and the dog will salivate even if you don't feed him. Uh, so, so cognitive behavioral therapy is built on that way of looking at the human being. It's, it's a jnana-based realm. Um, if we look at Charaka Samhita, uh, Sattva Vijaya is defined as the repetitive, restraining, holding, or focusing away of the mind from improper objects, meanings, or reasoning. Um, so this is, we could take this out and, and show it to a Western uh, psychologist with this translation, and they would think you were explaining cognitive behavioral therapy. So my suggestion is, we can't call Sattva Vijaya as psychology. We have to call it as cognitive behavioral psychology. And the techniques used in the cognitive behavioral realm, they, they integrate over perfectly with Sattva Vijaya. That restraining, that training of the mind, and, and the changing of behavior. And uh, Robert Snyder's lecture the other morning really went deep into Sattva Vijaya, and it was a perfect teaching of cognitive behavioral Sattva Vijaya mix. Um, and there's a lot more there, but I'm limited by time, so I won't go deeper. Psychodynamic. Psychodynamic is the realm of Vigyana. Vigyana is this internal looking, this, this, this level of inside knowledge. And so they're looking at repressed feelings, what, you're, what you haven't digested, something that was experienced and you didn't give time to, to look at the feelings, you, you pack them away, they need to be brought back out. Um, from the Western perspective, uh, Talk therapy is one of the main therapies used here. Uh, from an Ayurvedic perspective, all these different um, uh, repressed emotions, things that haven't been digested, all of that can be worked with with yoga asana, pranayama, and meditation. So this is the realm where that is going, when, the, when disorders are associated at this level, this is where we begin the treatment. And it's, it's different than the Sattva Vajaya. Um, at this level, we have bipolar disorders, we have uh, uh, PTSD, compulsive disorders, eating disorders, things of that nature. Um, let's see, any. Um, Bhutta Vidya, which I won't go into, uh, is, is also at this level. Um, Bhutta Vidya has two, two aspects there's the internally caused Bhutta Vidya and the externally caused Bhutta Vidya. Internally, Bhutta Vidya, um, standard uh, yoga therapy, yoga chikitsa has incredible results with external divage kits as needed. Um, humanistic psychology. So humanistic psychology is person-centered. It's about listening to the person. And the deeper we listen to them, if we really listen, that fact that there's somebody listening changes the situation. It changes what comes out of them. If you're talking by yourself, what comes out of you is very different than if somebody is, is consciously listening. And not just listening, but the intention of their listening. So there's a very subtle element to humanistic psychology. Um, one of the uh, main people in, in humanistic psychology is a, is a practitioner with the last name Gendlin. And Gendlin termed the, the phrase felt sense. Of getting the felt sense, the person is talking and feeling what's going on with them. And a lot of times, what a person is saying and what they're doing, there's an incongruence. And so he worked with listening to the person and creating a congruent reality between what their felt sense is and what they're doing in their life. He saw that they know what they need, but they're not, the brain, there's a disconnection between what their felt sense is and what their intellect is guiding them to. So on a certain level, humanistic psychology is a psychological uh, working with prokya parad. It's working with the mistake of the intellect and correcting that. Um, let's see. So uh, prokya, this this deep inner felt sense, this this connection. Um, uh, it's it's something that 
Ayurvedic physicians already do. Ayurvedic physicians listen to their clients. They take a deep time to, to get what's going on in the person's life and, and how their life is, is working. So pragya is being cultivated at the moment we listen to our clients. Pragya is being cultivated when we listen to our own body. When we do yoga, when we meditate, when we do asana, and we're getting in touch with what, what's moving us, what, what is happening inside of us, what, how's our prana moving, what is our state right now, what are we being called to, this deep level of, of awareness. This, when we cultivate that, we're cultivating pragya. When we help our clients cultivate that, we're helping to cultivate pragya in them. And we are thereby curing the, the mistake of pragya, their inability to, to listen to this inner felt sense. So this inner felt sense, it's in, in the last 20 years, has exploded, particularly in California. California's uh, cutting edge psychology, which is why I moved there. Um, <laughs> It's, it's the cutting edge. It's, uh, and, and in the somatic realm, uh, this has become a very big thing. So in somatic psychology, it's all about expressing that felt sense and getting in touch with the felt sense and developing what the body wants. And they see it as what the body wants. They're listening to their body, not getting that the body is being moved by prana. So that if they're listening to the body, they're actually listening to prana. And that by listening to prana, they're listening to that which moves prana. So I end with um, hopefully giving you a, a deeper understanding of pragya and how you've already been cultivating it and how now instead of implicitly cultivating it, you can be explicitly cultivating it, both in yourself and your clients. Thank you. Everyone, 
how to experience the Hindu. So why was he dressed like that? Is he dressed to indicate that he's Ram? I mean, um, oh, Ma, she is titled him Raja De Raja. That means uh, he is king of all the kings. Ma, she created a, a kingdom that is a uh, age of enlightenment kingdom. For that, he is the 40 kings or 46 kings, and he is the king to all of these kings. That's why the crown was given. I have a second question, I'm sorry. Uh, is there any reason for the Ramayana and the Mahabharata to be, re to be translated again when you have really Maharishis who uh, are Bhakti Yoga practitioners or very advanced practitioners who have already done such a fantastic job of that? Is there any reason for these two books to be translated in this day and age? Okay, could I understand? Say it again. Yes. You also mentioned that Dr. Tony is translating the Ramayana and the Mahabharata, right? Yes. So it's a work in progress, I guess you said that. Ramayana is already done. Mahabharata may be on the progress. Is there any reason for that to have for that to have been undertaken? Because we already have advanced bhakti yoga practitioners who have translated this book, you know, for everybody. I mean, pure bhakti yoga practitioners. So, is there any reason for it? Yes. To be retranslated. Good reason. Because that is a story. But. Uh, so the big reason is itihasa. Itihasa means blossoming totality, and that the blossoming totality in your self-referral nature. How to understand that blossoming totality in every structure of your own human physiology? That is more to know, be how to understand this itihasa. All that different characters within your own physiology. How to understand Sita? How to understand Ram, how to understand Angada, how to understand uh, even Pasya, even Ravana's father, how to where to see in the human physiology. What so is the function? From the, from the, from Understanding the whole story of Ram, Ramayana, and brought back to the physiology. How to understand this whole structure of physiology is a blossoming totality, Itihasa. Itihasa is a branch of Brahmanas. Brahmanas has six branches. Maharshi, this is the greatest contribution for Maharshi to the whole human mankind. Maharshi, as a, because of lack of time, I didn't mention. What is Maharshi Ayurveda? Maharshi Ayurveda, so many people thinking, what is Maharshi Ayurveda? Maharshi Ayurveda is enlivening the 40 branches of Veda and Vedic literature. That is Maharshi Ayurveda. Learning. Enlivening. 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 See, the, as I said in the chart, First one is Veda, first one is Atma, Veda, and Sharira, and Vishwa, and Brahma. So Veda is one-to-one -one relationship with the structure and function of the human physiology. And also now he came up with Ramayana is one-to-one -one relationship with our structure and function of our physiology. Everything is our structure and function of our physiology. All the literature of Veda is our structure and function of our physiology. Now he's coming up with different aspects of how to understand this. Within the Brahmanas, there are six branches. Upanishad, Aranyat, Brahmanas, and Itihasa, Purana, and Smriti. These are the six branches. And how this abstract becomes concrete, and concrete becomes abstract. This is the structure, how the self becomes the abstract becomes the concrete, the human physiology. Again, this human physiology in relationship with abstract. So this is what is the feedback loop. So everything in the Vedic literature is feedback loop, knowing yourself through experience. That's why he is writing his books. Thank you. But more human development of consciousness and experience shall be. So I just wanted to add a little comment to that in light of this lady's question that it isn't so much a new translation or a whole new set of that, but really elucidating the connections in, in, in find, finding, locating, explaining, elucidating the Ved in human physiology and finding those aspects in different parts of the physiology. So not so much a whole new translation, but an explication in that regard. Nancy Watkinson has taken his supreme courses. Now he's offering courses for 
everyone. Uh, she has taken like three, four courses from him there. I didn't take any course. <laughs> so she knows much more. But you know, you know. <laughs> uh, my question is for Freedom. Um, so you said at the beginning of your um, of your talk that well, well, how we say things, what language we use, influences how we think about it. And so my question is that later on, I understand you know Western science, Western modern science is the dominant perspective in the world, and so I understand why you say yes, we have to acquiesce when it says uh, CBT instead of Satvavidaya, but. My question is then, is it not also valuable to enliven and, and bring out Satya Vidaya uh, and, and all of those other techniques, those other ideas, under their own original names, because that also brings a different quality? Um, I think we always have to use the original name, but when we explain what that original name means, mm -hmm. we have to make sure that we're putting it into the right terminology. The thing with... Uh, languaging is that do you, unless your birth language is Sanskrit, there's somebody telling you what Sattva Vajaya is. Mm -hmm. And so that English term that somebody's told you that it is, shapes what you believe it right. is. So I'm not saying let's not use Sanskrit. I'm mm -hmm. saying with that Sanskrit, how we bring it into English matters. I understand. Okay. And personally, I prefer Sanskrit any day. And in my writings, and you even saw in my presentation, there's lots of parentheses with the Sanskrit word, just because the Sanskrit word has such deeper, deeper meanings than English can ever have. But when we do bring that into English, how we bring that into English matters. Okay, thank you. Yes. Hi, so my question is for Freedom, too. So, I don't think my question's totally formulated, but I'll try anyway. So my question is, so let's say from a, to go a little more into the Ayurvedic perspective, so let's say you were talking about using like um, techniques of, to help with jnana, pragya, and vijnana, right? So let's say in, uh, let's say in a, uh, a kapha, um, vakrati in manava shotas, what would you, how would you look at that from your so, perspective? So, you know, I only had 30 minutes. Sure. sure. Uh, but, um, uh, Just so, an example. Yeah. So there's, there's two types of, of disease when we look at the mind. Sure. There's uh, dehi manasika and, and, manas, and, and manas dehi. So okay. when the body is causing a disorder in the mind and when the mind is causing a disorder in the body. Okay. And what I was focused on is when the mind is causing a disorder in the body, right. not the other way around. So, and, and both are, are, they're both valid, and for us to be able to distinguish what is causing, you know, is there a mental imbalance, is the person, did somebody die in the family, they're depressed and they're eating too much and, and that's causing, or do they have a, a kapha imbalance and that's why they're gaining weight and that's making them depressed. So, that differentiation is a very important differentiation that we need to make. So, the, everything that I presented was, was mind, from mind. Got it. So in, let's say it's the mind causing it then, okay. to clarify. So then would you, like, when I look at this, I think it looks like most conditions of today need all three. Would you agree? You speak so, to the mind. Oh, sorry. It seems like it, look, it looks like most mental health conditions of today would need jnana, vijnana, and pragya approaches, would you say? The key is, again, what's the root of, of the problem? Okay. And, uh, and just to transfer into, um, a uh, physical thing is is the person eating wrong or are they not sleeping enough or are they you know right. and, and so we use all of them but we have to understand what the big mm -hmm. uh, cause of an issue is okay. and um, when we look at the vigyana level we're looking at their specific symptoms that are associated on that level the a humanistic uh, psychologist can't treat and cognitive behavioral can't treat yeah, like yeah. for example PTSD yeah. um, when they do uh, PTSD cognitive behavioral PTSD treatments on vets coming back from uh, Afghanistan and Iraq mm -hmm. the rate of suicide is is I mean they just kill themselves left and right because it's just yeah. you're trying to train them uh, as if it's a cognitive issue yeah. that's going on where yoga therapy has been incredibly successful because it's working on that deeper chronic level. Mm -hmm. okay. 
So, so in that way, we, we differentiate. And you can still do some cognitive behavioral techniques, but where is your focus going to be? You're welcome. And, and just to add to that, as, as practitioners, when we understand this, this information, then when we have clients with mental disorders, we also have the ability to send them to the right mental health practitioners to help them most effectively. And, and we can work in conjunction. Thank you, thank you. Sorry for your time. One more time? Did you say yes or no? You can say no. <laughs> <laughs> We um, learned from Maharshi um, the term Nama Rupa, and um, I don't know, because I, I heard it directly from him, I don't know if it's a standard understanding in, in the Sanskrit scholarly world, but my understanding is that consciousness is primary, as, as Dr. Manohar brought out. Um, consciousness is all that there is fundamentally, and then when it interacts with itself, that interaction of knower knowing and process of knowing, or we should be able to touch on this, results in some liveliness, some awake, awakening up of consciousness, and that consciousness results in frequency or shruti, and then shruti becomes sound, and those sounds, those earliest frequencies, those most primordial frequencies, create, bathe, and bathe, is, is, is the Sanskrit language. And so, is this the understanding that's pretty standard in the world of scholarly Sanskrit, that, that consciousness <coughs> creates these sounds, so the actual relationship between the name and the form, the word that we hear in Sanskrit, is, is, is the real <laughs> connection, is the real frequency, the real name. So, so if we looked at that verse from the Brihadaranyaka Upanishad yeah. and, and the previous verses to that, that's literally what it's talking about. And, uh, and that's a standard in people, you know, when we say grammarians, we think it's a boring thing. But ancient India, grammarians, uh, Patanjali was a grammarian. Grammarians, it was a very high position to, to be in. It was, it was an unga of, of the Veda. Because grammar and how things are stated shapes our consciousness. And so uh, consciousness forms into language, and language shapes consciousness. So there's a direct interaction. It's a, it's a reciprocal action. Yes. But, but, I mean, I could have spent a half an hour just on that verse. And, and, yeah. So thank you very much for uh, wonderful questions and answers, and uh, thank you for your patience. I'm sorry we kept you waiting for uh, almost seven minutes. I will take uh, two minutes, less than two minutes. So the announcement is that in your every folder you have a reflection sheet. So only seven, eight questions are there. How the meals is there? How your accommodation? Maybe you are staying all or staying outside. Sponsors display and overall quality of presentations, conference room size and layout, conference registration procedure, information communication provided to the conference, and information communication provided before the conference, and everything is in display to the website and everything. Please give your honest information. You don't need to put your name, that way, no our police is not inquiring about you. <laughs> okay? So additional comments, you can write additional comments and feedbacks to us. That will be a wonderful thing. That is the reason the feedback is given by the participants. We are successfully, we are doing 21 conferences. We are heading to 100 conferences. Be ready for the patients. Thank you. And uh, tomorrow, we come at the, uh, sharply at uh, uh, anybody leading the meditation, morning meditation. Would like to do lead meditation, morning meditation. Is open for that platform. If not, 8.30, please come. 8.30, 8.45. So our uh, guest of honor, Dr. John Heglin, is the president of the MUM. He is coming. We want him to be seated here, not at 9 o'clock. Please come before 10 minutes before into the room. So that way, the guest of honor is coming, and we want him to respect him and uh, take care of that. Thank you very much. Have a good night, good sleep. Samadhi state. Thank you. They go there. Where you're
brain's going. I spent the last 20 years meditating and working and researching yeah, yeah. and trying to understand. Uh, Shekhar Ji is doing everything about life, so you have to do the best questions. Discipline, like jump, 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 jump. Big eye, kid has knowledge for all. Because parents let us let the kids stay up as late as they want, we can jump food, behavior, behavioral lifestyle, and all the behavioral treatments that we give to people in Ayurveda are all behavior. And they have to be like, okay, now my Ayurvedic practitioner told me I've got to go to bed by 10 o'clock, and so I'm going to retrain. So that's good. They're using their brain. They're using their straight brain. Yeah. Um, it's deeper. We don't value our own. Let's say.